Lord has specifically chosen you to be here at this time and in this place. You have incredible potential, purpose, and calling to push back the darkness and be a light for Christ. Stand for nothing and you'll fall for anything. It's time to stand your ground. This is Unapologetic. and welcome to Unapologetic. I am so excited to have my dad with us today, Dr. Robert Jeffress. We are talking about how we can know certain things about the Christian faith, how we can know that Jesus is God, how we can know for sure that we're going to heaven when we die, how we can know that Christianity is the right religion, and so many more questions that so many of us have, and we don't really know who to ask or what the answer is. I am so excited to interview my favorite pastor today, who is also the pastor at First Baptist Church in Dallas, Texas, and the host of Pathway to Victory, which is on radio, podcast, and TV. Please help me welcome my dad, Dr. Robert (laughs) Jeffress. Hi, Dad. Well, thank you for having me back again. (laughs) Appreciate it. Yes. Okay. Whenever you're coming on the show, I always think about um, how we used to have Ask the Pastor. (laughs) That's everyone's favorite thing. Uh, So for years, we had Ask the Pastor, and people would submit questions. Yes. And you wouldn't know them ahead of time. It was everybody's favorite Sunday night. And uh, people would just ask you, you'd have someone like me asking you questions. And some of them were really funny. And then some of them really were um, close to the heart, ones that probably so many people had, but never really vocalized. Do you remember kind of a theme of what people usually asked about? You know what? One of the things I heard you say recently that is so true is when it comes down to it, people are interested in issues that affect them. And I'd say, you know, probably the number one question people ask is, why does God allow evil in the world? Mm -hmm. Specifically, why does he allow evil and suffering in my world? Right. And uh, I think it was our friend Lee Strobel you've had on the Mm -hmm. podcast here before He did a survey, and the number one question people said they would ask God if they had an opportunity to Mm. was that question. So it's one of the things we talk about in How Can I Know? Mm -hmm. I wrote this book, Julia, because I do believe Christians need to have clear answers, Mm -hmm. biblical answers Mm -hmm. to questions. And so I took the seven top questions people ask, Mm -hmm. and I spent a year using the very best research to answer the question, how can I know the Bible is true? Now, I know most Christians aren't going to read an entire book on the inspiration of the scripture. So mm-hmm. I took, you know, from hundreds of books, the very best arguments and distilled mm-hmm. them into 30 pages, one chapter. Yeah. How can I know there is a God? How can mm-hmm. I know uh, there is a heaven? How can I know God is good with all the suffering in the world? How can mm-hmm. I know Christianity is the right religion? So I take seven of those questions and give easy to understand answers and more importantly, biblical answers right. to those questions. How can I know has a special place just in my life because I have having worked with teenagers for so long and, you know, we're all scared as parents by the statistics that it's 80 percent of Christian teens that are raised in church, leave the church and don't come back after they graduate. And I really believe just from experience in ministry, but also from reading studies, a lot of times it is because their questions haven't been answered. Yeah. Their parents can't answer them. Their churches aren't answering them. And then even if they're answered, I just want to go one step further for how counseling comes in, even if they're answered academically or theologically, maybe there's some kind of miss in how it personally affects their lives. And so I was going to say, like, we give this book to all the seniors that graduate from First Baptist Dallas. Mm -hmm. And every year I'll have a college student that has graduated and they're like, hey, can I get another one of those? (laughs) How can I know books? So I just want to say, like, especially for teenagers, you know, uh, they're probably not sitting around reading tons of books. And a lot of people don't like to read. This is a great just reference guide, like just real quick. Oh, what's that explanation? Explanation again. What's that verse again? Right. And, and then also, I've given it to a lot of non Christians, mm-hmm. uh, people that are searching. Maybe they haven't accepted Christ, but they are interested in these subjects. And matters. they're embarrassed to ask right. the questions. Right. They don't want to be shamed or right. anything. Uh, but how do I really know there I mean, is a God? I don't know any of this. I mean, is true. How, how do you know? <laughs> yeah. And right. so, uh, so let's I, jump right in. Okay, let's okay. do it. How do we know there's God? I'm just going to rapid fire. 
Well, I mean, what's the alternative? I mean, the naturalist explanation for how everything we see, just think about it. How did it all come into existence? Here's what the naturalist says. Nothing times no one equals everything. <laughs> that, that doesn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. How does uh, nothing become everything? Mm -hmm. And think about just living beings like you and me. Well, mm -hmm. the evolutionist says it's the right collection of amino acids and energy coming together. I love what one person said. How did inanimate material organize itself to contemplate itself. I mean, <laughs> mm -hmm. how did that happen? Yeah. You know, I think Sir Frederick Hoyle said the chances of a single cell coming into existence by itself is one in a number with 40,000 zeros behind wow. it. And that's for one cell. Mm -hmm. It couldn't have happened accidentally. Then how do you get multiple cells? Mm -hmm. How do you have something as complex as the eyeball that even Charles Darwin said couldn't come into existence by accident? Mm -hmm. um, I think there's evidence all around us that there is a God. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, the fact that we care about evil. Mm -hmm. Why do we care about evil? Why do we call some things good and right. other things evil. Why don't we take the most horrendous things mm. that are done to other people and instead of calling them evil, call them orange? Mm. I mean, what is it that gives us wow. e good and evil? That sense, well, we're created in the image of somebody mm -hmm. who understands good and evil. So there are a lot of arguments, scientific arguments, mm. uh, uh, moral arguments for the existence of God. Mm. Uh, the same reason some people can't find God is the same way... Uh, uh, a thief can't find a police officer. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, they're not looking. Right. And uh, the bottom line is... People, and don't want to. Yeah, they don't want to. Mm -hmm. People people don't want to acknowledge they're a God to whom they're accountable for. Mm -hmm. People don't reject God for uh, scientific reasons. Mm -hmm. Some of the greatest scientists in human history were Christians, right. you know. Uh, Isaac a lot of people Newton. don't know that. Yeah, Isaac Newton, mm -hmm. uh, Louis Pasteur, mm -hmm. other great scientists, mm -hmm. uh, they believed that the world was created in an orderly way that could be studied and mm. replicated. And so uh, it's not for intellectual or scientific reasons. It's moral reasons. Mm -hmm. People don't want to ex admit there's a God. Mm -hmm. uh, I heard somebody say one time, a man's morality determines his theology. Right. Wow. And uh, I think that's true. And something has to give whenever yeah. it doesn't add up. Right. I know. That would happen a lot um, just with students, unfortunately, that we've seen walk away from the faith. It wasn't that suddenly they'd done this deep study and they came to a different conclusion. No. It was that they decided they didn't want to morally follow the biblical commandments, usually for sexuality. And, and I think that's mm -hmm. true. I think it would be wrong to relegate all of it to that right. because I do think there's some people who experience abuse as a child. Absolutely. And they can't accept that there's a God who would allow that to happen. Mm. And so one of the questions we talk about, how can I know God is good with all the suffering in the world? Mm. And and what you, can you say to people mm -hmm. like that yeah. that might remove that roadblock that's keeping them from coming to God? Mm -hmm. And I, I mean, just because you're bringing up abuse, because that's almost like exclusively what I worked with for years, I just haven't found that even even to be true, like almost the most difficult things we experience in life, like the Bible is clear that God's close to the brokenhearted. Yeah. And so really some of, just to give people hope that are listening, if that's where you are, I mean, some of the most amazing Christians I know that I've had really neat conversations with have had horrible experiences. And God was the only way they were able to make sense of it yeah. and be able to have any hope and be able to forgive. And so just realizing there's really no experience you can have that somehow makes it where you're taken out of being able to experience God. You really experience them in a deeper, closer way. You know, people say, well, where was God, you know, on 9-11? Mm -hmm. Where was God when this happened? Where was God? And they'll give some terrible personal example. Mm -hmm. And I say not in a flippant way at mm -hmm. all, but in a very understanding way, he was the same place mm -hmm. he was when his son was being tortured right. and crucified. Mm -hmm. I mean, God is close to the brokenhearted. Mm -hmm. uh, God is there. And God doesn't always immediately put an end to suffering, mm -hmm. but the good news, ultimately, he will put an end to all suffering mm -hmm. and justice will be done. Mm -hmm. And it is a mystery because some people yeah. do try to explain 
every ounce of this is why this happened. This is why this happened to you and to me. And we don't know. I mean, there is an element that's a mystery, but there's hope in the truth of knowing there ultimately is a purpose. So I want to, you know, we're trying to get through as many of these questions as possible. <laughs> um, which we should I wondered if I was going to have enough to say about oh, each of these. you are, you are. <laughs> um, okay, Jesus is God. How can we know that Jesus is God? And let's also talk about, of course, when people say Jesus never claimed to be God, which is false. Well, I think, first of all, the way we know he's God is he claimed to be God mm -hmm. over and over again. He Why do people think he didn't? Just because they bought into the myth out there that Jesus never claimed to be God, that that was something his disciples and overzealous followers added mm. to make a good story, a better story. They see that in movies mm. like The Da Vinci Code oh. and other things, and they get their theology from that. Mm. But, you know, for example, I mean, Jesus, during his first trial after the Garden of Gethsemane, he was arrested, taken to the home of Caiaphas, the high priest. And Caiaphas asked him, he said, I'm, you know, I'm tired of being awakened in the middle of the night for this. Let's cut the, the chase. Are you the son of God or what? Mm -hmm. And he said, I am. Mm -hmm. And he quoted a uh, pass passage from Daniel 7 about the Messiah, said, you'll see the Son of Man coming. And uh, Caiaphas was so angry, he ripped his robe and condemned him to death. Mm -hmm. uh, Caiaphas understood what Jesus was mm -hmm. saying. The reason the religious leaders crucified him is not because he told people to turn the other cheek. It's mm -hmm. because he claimed to be God. Right. That's why he got himself crucified. Mm -hmm. So don't buy into the myth that Jesus never claimed to be God. He claimed that over and over and over. And I guess this is what C.S. Lewis talked about when he said he talked about his famous trilemma. He said, you can't say that Jesus is just a good man, a good teacher, because he never gave you that option. Jesus claimed to be God, and that only gives you one of three alternatives. Either Jesus was a liar, that is, he knew he wasn't God, but he claimed to be. Do you think Jesus was a liar? If he wasn't a liar, he was a lunatic. He claimed to be something he thought was true that wasn't and ought to be locked up in an insane asylum. Do you think Jesus was a lunatic? If you don't believe he was a liar, if you don't believe he was a lunatic, given what he claims, you have to believe he's Lord. Mm. And of course, the greatest proof, Julia, that Jesus is God is that he was raised from the right. dead. And um, uh, Paul said in Romans 1, he was declared to be the son of God by power from his resurrection from the dead. And, uh, you know, a few years ago, Bill O'Reilly wrote a book uh, about Jesus, killing Jesus, that was a mega bestseller. And he asked me to review a copy. And, you know, uh, I thought the most important thing Bill said at the end of the book was... Uh, for 2,000 years, Jesus' body has not been found, yeah. and the grave still remains empty. Mm. And, you know, that's true. Mm. And, uh, you know, people say, well, somebody stole the body. Well, who would have stolen the body? Uh, the disciples didn't have the courage to do it, to overtake a Roman guard unit. Mm -hmm. I mean, when uh, even during his trials, they all fled from Jesus. They were mm -hmm. afraid to death of uh, being associated with him. They didn't have the courage to do it. The Romans and the Jewish leaders didn't have the motivation to steal the body. They wanted that body to remain in the grave, which was why they went to such mm -hmm. an extent to seal it up. Yeah. And if they had known where that body was, whether the Jewish leaders or the Roman leaders, they would have wheeled that body through the streets of Jerusalem right. to say, he's not risen from the dead. He's right mm -hmm. here. And Christianity would have been stillborn before it got off the ground. No, the tomb is empty, and I think that's the greatest evidence yeah. for the deity of Jesus. Oh, I love that. I I do really enjoy hearing the example of because we don't talk about this a lot with the resurrection that Jesus appeared to many people. Five hundred, yes, and then those people went on to die for their faith because they had that assurance. That is one of the strongest evidences. Uh, was the early acceptance of the resurrection mm -hmm. message by the disciples. It was within a matter of days that mm -hmm. the message started spreading that Jesus was alive. 
Seven weeks after the resurrection, Peter was standing before thousands Mm. of Jews and making that proclamation he was alive. Mm. And you had Jews overnight changing their most cherished traditions, their day of worship, Mm -hmm. ending the sacrificial system, all these seismic changes, Mm. all based on the resurrection. Uh, if it wasn't true, it could have been disproved. Uh, I always really enjoy reading more than a carpenter. Yeah. And, uh, Josh McDowell always makes the point, no one dies for a lie. So yeah. there, of course, and I've heard you explain this too, uh, of course, there are religious zealots in every religion that die for their faith. They die for a lie, but not for something they know is a lie. Right. <laughs> exactly. You don't, you don't give up your life to perpetuate something you know to be right. untrue. And so there's no reason the disciples would have been martyred yeah. if Jesus had not been resurrected yeah. willingly. Yeah. So how can I know? I know that this idea is in there, but I want us just to kind of talk about it because it's not really a clear cut chapter. I want to talk about salvation, of course, how we can know that we're going to heaven. But then I want to do kind of part two of that question of what do people do when they mess up? Because we do all know people who say, I used to be a Christian, but now I'm not. What do we do with that? But let's talk first about how can we know that we're for sure going to heaven when we die? Can we know for sure? Because some, um, of course, religions would say that you can't know. Well, again, I think we have to go back to the authority of the Bible mm-hmm. and what Jesus himself said. Jesus said, um, and I think the clearest um, explanation of salvation is in John chapter 3. Jesus was talking to Nicodemus. He was a religious man, a Pharisee. Mm-hmm. He was... Uh, a righteous man. He did good things. He was wealthy, but he was unsettled about his eternal destiny. And Jesus said, you have to be born again. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, Nicodemus didn't understand that. And so Jesus explained what it meant to be born again. Knowing that Nicodemus was a Jew, he used an illustration out of uh, uh, the book of Numbers, in which in the Old Testament, the children of Israel were being bit by the fiery serpents that God had sent to discipline them, and they were dying. And uh, Moses asked for help from God, and God said, this is what you need to do, Moses. If you want the people to live, make a bronze serpent, put it on the edge of a pole, stick the pole up, and tell the people if they will simply look at that serpent, they will live. Hmm. Look and live was the message Mm -hmm. And Jesus took that, and he said to Nicodemus, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must I, the Son of Man, be lifted up, that whoever believes in me shall not perish. And then the famous verse he gave, for God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. There's one thing we must do, and that is believe. That word believe doesn't mean an intellectual belief. It means to put your whole faith in, to uh, depend on, to lean on. Anybody who understands that they're a sinner, that they deserve God's punishment, but they wholly lean on what Jesus did for them on the cross can have eternal life. Mm -hmm. And Jesus said that, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Can you speak a little bit, um, just contrasting that with the scripture, even the demons believe and shudder? Yeah, I think the greatest misconception about salvation is the idea, if I just believe intellectually the right Mm -hmm. things about Jesus, I'll be saved. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, the demons believe that Jesus is the Son Mm -hmm. of God. Remember when they were indwelling the uh, gathering demoniac, they saw Jesus and said, why are you coming uh, to trouble us, O Holy One of Israel. They understood he was the Messiah. Mm-hmm. Demons believe and Satan believes that Jesus died on the cross for the sins of the world. Mm-hmm. And Juliet, even demons and Satan believe that Jesus was raised from the dead. Mm-hmm. In fact, I tell people they believe it more than we do because they actually witnessed it. Right. But no demon and certainly Satan are not going to be in heaven mm-hmm. because they understand the right things about right. Jesus. That word believe means to depend upon, to lean on, to put your whole weight upon. Mm. The kind of belief that saves is a belief that says, I believe Jesus died for my sins mm-hmm. and I'm trusting in him to have eternal life. I think one of my favorite ways that I've ever heard you explain it, I mean, you explain it 
many times during the year this way, but always at Vacation Bible School to hundreds of children. And it's just such a good picture because the Bible says that salvation is a gift. It's yeah. a gift from God. And you you will have a box and you have this pretty gift. And the idea is you can know that the gift's for you. You can know it's there. You can believe it's real, but it's not yours until you personally receive it. It really is simple. The Bible says it's so simple that a child can understand it. And we do a lot at our church, of course, to really minister to children. Uh, studies show that most people who accept Christ do so before they're 15. And, and so there's there, a reason there's for a that. There's a reason. I mean, mm -hmm. the older you get, the more baggage you carry with you right. and that can weigh you down and keep you from entering into mm -hmm. the kingdom of God. Mm. And that's why we don't apologize. We're unapologetic <laughs> about uh, sharing the gospel with mm -hmm. children so that they can understand at an early age. Now, you know, I tell parents all the time, there are some basic things your children have to understand. Mm -hmm. Not all children are the same, no. but a child needs to understand that He's a sinner, mm -hmm. and they need to understand that Jesus died for their sins, and they have to be able to depend upon him for eternal life. Mm -hmm. But I think they come to an understanding of that much sooner than we think they're capable of right. coming. Julia, I give this warning all the time to parents. Be sure you speak clearly about salvation. Mm -hmm. Salvation is not inviting Jesus into your heart. Mm -hmm. I just tell our people all the time, don't ever talk about Jesus coming into your heart. That's not biblical. If you mm -hmm. ask a little child, oh, honey, do you want Jesus in your heart? Well, what child wouldn't want Jesus in their heart? Mm -hmm. That's not what salvation is. Mm -hmm. It is trusting in Jesus for the forgiveness of mm -hmm. sins. That's awesome. Okay. I want to end today just talking about what so many families are facing and uh, people in the church face. It's someone that they started the Christian life with or they were there when that person professed Christ and they walk, they fall away. They say, yeah. I'm, I'm not a Christian anymore. Yeah. Um, is it possible not to be a Christian anymore or what, what happens there? Well, I think the biblical answer is what John says. They went out from us because they were not of us. Hmm. For had they been of us, they would not have gone out from us. Mm -hmm. And I do think some Christians can have a lapse of faith. Something happens mm -hmm. that makes them question it may be their own disobedience or some tragedy. Mm -hmm. And, but I think a true Christian will always come back. Mm -hmm. And if a, Somebody who claims to be a Christian falls away and never comes back. Uh, it's just evidence they were never saved. Mm. We call that the perseverance of the saints. Yeah. Um, that doctrine has been changed to once saved, always saved. Mm -hmm. But originally, it was meant that true saints are ones who persevere until the end. Mm -hmm. And so I, I don't think people lose their salvation, mm. but I think there are many people who mistakenly think they're saved, mm -hmm. and they're, they're not. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, Jesus said in Matthew 7, in the Sermon on the Mount, in, the, in that day, the judgment day, many will come to me saying, Lord, right. didn't we do this in your name, and didn't we do this? And I will say to them, depart from me. I never knew mm -hmm. you. So it's a sobering passage. There is a flip side to this that I only really became aware of actually in the counseling sessions. And that's a lot of people who have professed Christ and they're very anxious about if they're really saved. Yeah. And I, I really had never experienced that before because for me, there's always been a lot of peace with that. Mm -hmm. But it really is a real issue that people face. Yes. They're like, I've believed, I believe this. I accepted Christ at camp. Like, am I really saved? What should people do if they're anxious about if what they I don't say, know? is quit trying to look at the past and unravel mm -hmm. what you may or may not have done. Mm -hmm. Because as we get older, our memories fade mm -hmm. and we don't quite remember everything. If you're anxious about it, instead of trying to look at the past, look at right now. Do mm -hmm. the one thing now that the Bible says you must do mm -hmm. to be saved. If you're not sure whether you're going to heaven right now, close mm -hmm. your eyes and say, Dear God, I know I'm a sinner. Mm -hmm. I know I failed you. I know I deserve your punishment. Mm -hmm. But I believe with all of my heart that Jesus died for me. And right now, I'm trusting in him to save me from my sins. Mm -hmm. And you can know if you do that, you've done the one thing the Bible says you must do to be saved. 
That's so good. I've had different experiences with that because there was one time it was a girl I'd known her whole life. I'm just going to give two different contrary examples. And she said, I don't know if I'm a Christian. I don't know if I'm going to heaven. And my immediate reaction was to be like, oh, yeah, you are. Like, you you go to church and you've told me your testimony. And like that that was like what I was tempted mm-hmm. to immediately do is reassure her. And God just stopped me like in yeah. my tracks and was like, who are you to tell her that Wrong. she's saved? And I said, well, I mean, if you're feeling anxious, like you need to ask God what you're supposed to do and you should pray it again because yeah. you have the desire and you know how to go to heaven. And so if you have that concern, I can't tell you that you're saved. Yeah, whether it's a conviction of the Holy Spirit, right. it very well may be. Mm-hmm. It may be Satan trying to destroy your mm-hmm. peace of mind. Mm-hmm. But either way, the best answer is to do right now what mm-hmm. you know you need to do to be right. saved. I think just for this generation, it, it is not popular, of course. It never has been. But to say Christianity is the only right religion, can you just give us some of the best arguments for how, how is Christianity different? from other religions, and then how can we know it's the right one? You know, uh, there's a story about C.S. Lewis, the Oxford Don. He was at a British conference on world religions, and um, in one of the breakout groups, he walked into the room, and people were in a heated argument. He said, what's the rumpus about? And they said, well, we're trying to differentiate what makes Christianity different from any other religion in the world. He said, that's easy. It's grace. Hmm. And that's one of the way I think we know Christianity really is different. Yeah. Every other religion, doesn't matter which religion you uh, talk about, they're all the same. They're all spelled D-O. Do this, mm-hmm. do this, do this. Mm-hmm. Follow this list. Different religions have different lists, but they all have lists. Do this, and you may get to heaven when you die. But Christianity is the only religion spelled D-O-N-E. Done. Mm. It's all been done by Jesus Christ. And I think that's the way we know Christianity is the right religion. It has the only solution to man's dilemma, and Mm -hmm. that's grace. Wow. That's amazing. Well, how can our listeners, uh, by how can I know, how can they get that? And then uh, how can they connect more with you and your ministry? Well, how can I know is available at uh, amazon.com and uh, our ministry is Pathway to Victory. Uh, You can hear my podcast and broadcast, or Unapologetic, both Mm -hmm. at ptv.org. And then also on iTunes. I do want to say for how can I know, uh, for Bible study leaders or parents, it is a great book just to study in a group and with your family. And if you go to ptv.org, there's uh, not only the book, but a leader's guide and the DVDs Mm -hmm. that go with it. And you can use it as a study. That's fantastic. Well, thank you for being on today. It's great to be with you, Julia. (laughs) And congratulations on all the success of Unapologetic. Thank you. Thanks for tuning in today to Unapologetic. Remember that you can hear today's episode and more at ptv.org slash Julia and wherever you get your podcasts. Stay connected with Julia and Unapologetic on all social media channels. By doing so, you'll be the first to hear about new episodes and other news. To follow Julia and Unapologetic on social media, go to ptv.org slash Julia. Julia.